have Professor Stephen Marshall um, join us for the presentation today. Uh, Stephen is a professor in urban morphology and urban design at the Bartlett School of Planning at the University College London. Dr. Marshall has over 20 years of experience in the built environment fields, initially in consultancy and subsequently in academia. His principal research interests are in urban morphology and street layouts and their relationships with urban formative processes, including urban design, coding, and planning. He has written or edited several books, including Streets and Patterns, came out in 2005, Land Use and Transport, came out in 2007, together with, edited together with David Bannister, Cities Design and Evolution in 2009, and Urban Coding and Planning in 2011. He was chair of the editorial board of Urban Design and Planning, uh, which, is which is the proceedings of the Institute of Civil Engineers and Journal Series from its launch until 2012. And he is now co-editor of the Built Environment Journal. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stephen Marshall. Stephen, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can take <coughs> over the slide. And I again emphasize for the audience to please um, use the chat window actively uh, as questions, comments come up, and we'll start summarizing them towards the latter part of the presentation. Well, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, many thanks for the in invitation and, and the introduction. Um, I think I'll, I'll probably try and just make a, st a start right away, because things like sharing screens can sometimes take a few seconds. So if you just let me find um where where i'm supposed to be um, okay can you see my uh title screen yes yeah <clears throat> really okay yeah so so uh thank you very much for the introduction my my title is uh, Urban Science, Pseudoscience and Urban Design. Um, it's a slight uh, tweak on uh, the name of a paper I, I wrote 10 years ago called Science, Pseudoscience and Urban Design. Um, I, the, today's talk, I'm aiming to basically try and um, help reflect on your question um, about urban science contribution to urban design through the lens of pseudoscience at least in part. So, um, I mean, I start with this quotation from Jane Jacobs, because uh, it's always quite nice to remind ourselves. So as in the pseudoscience of bloodletting, just so in the pseudoscience of city rebuilding and planning, years of learning and a plethora of subtle and complicated dogma have arisen on a foundation of nonsense. And I, I think that's quite a nice quotation, obviously, because it's kind of ironic because Jane Jacobs' book, of course, became one of the classics of urban planning, let's say, um, um, and uh, you know, in a sense, one of the most popular books on urban planning, which has su been such a sort of damning crit critique of planning. Um, how many fields of, 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 of science, let's say, d does, does that happen? I just pose that as a rhetorical question. But as I say, my presentation is it's, it's centered on this paper that I wrote in, in 2012. Um, but as I say, um, I, I will use this to apply this to the, the question uh, of this series, which is what does urban science have to say about urban design? So uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the, the middle part uh, shown in the curly brackets is based uh, rather directly on the paper I wrote, and that's about science and pseudoscience and urban design. Before that, I'll say a few words about urban design and urban science. And then after that, I will say, I, I will talk a little bit about urban science and pseudoscience, perhaps with a question mark, um, and then uh, on to a conclusion uh, to, to kind of try and summarize a, an answer to your question. Okay, so we start with urban design. So what is urban design? Well, there are many definitions, some of which I've tried to review in various papers. Um, one that I thought up for now is you could say it's to do with the art of placemaking or the design of human facing urban ensembles at a scale of urban streets, 
squares and blocks. By ensembles, I mean it's not one single object, perhaps, but it's it's a bringing together different urban elements at a certain scale. And that's maybe what we typically think of urban design when we think of urban design as a profession or, or, or as a, a course of study and as, an, or as a discipline. Of course, more broadly, some people might say, well, urban design is a more general thing, doesn't necessarily need a professional uh, urban design professional. It could be any kind of design in the built environment, you know, from manhole covers and street lamps to highways and, and skyscrapers. So I think any any discussion of what urban design is, I think it's useful to to allow some flexibility. And if we were talking about urban design in the narrow, narrower sense or, or, or in a broader sense. And I would say, arguably, it's theory uh, that gives urban design its status as an academic discipline, uh, rather than it as being a, like just just a craft, as it were. Um, similar has been claimed for architecture. So, in this presentation and the paper at the centre of it, I use urban design theory here to refer to a kind of integrated theory um, that includes a view on how the world works, hence why there is a role for science. Uh, as well as um, supporting an approach to actually doing urban design. So uh, this little graphic, rather crude graphic, is, is just meant to position urban design theory in the middle, uh, almost like a kind of platform, um, on which can be built, uh, like the art and practice of urban design, which could be many diverse things, but also that the urban design theory is uh, has a, some kind of scientific underpinning. Um, and as the caption says, it reminds me that the scientific foundations may be partly exposed or, or maybe partly hidden. Um, I'd also add that sometimes, sometimes urban design theory, it could be a bit of a black box as well. Um, um, but what I would suggest in context of today is that so-called urban science could clearly could be part of the, the, the scientific uh, support. And, and maybe that could be a, a reasonable starting assumption. Okay, so what is urban science? Now, I, I, I guess I guess a lot of you guys may know, may have a better idea, or uh, as a practicing urban scientist than myself, but um, I, I put forward some thoughts nevertheless. So, I mean, one thought is that you could say, in a broad sense, that urban science is any science or the use of scientific method used to support the understanding of cities or urban areas. Um, including how they have developed and also how they they might be designed or planned. So obviously, um, you know, it could be narrower or, or broader. It could include urban design, the design of cities, and also the the growth or evolution or development of cities, if you so chose. Um, and I guess there there are lots of sciences that obviously can contribute to to urban design. I just use one example. Um, so. The traditional scientific um, inputs to urban design, if you like, could include, for example, the understanding of trees, the study of botany or arboriculture, linked to things like air quality, shade, uh, microclimate and biophilia. And those could all be support the use of, say, street trees in urban design. So urban designers can always be informed by some kind of science. And I guess we, as urban designers, uh, could and should always make use of the available scientific um, knowledge. But I think urban science in, in the term proposed here, it, it, or in this, this series, probably means something slightly more focused. Um, and and I, I just took a, a kind of a quick uh, Google search and came came up with this, uh, this definition just, just out of interest. Uh, from Wikipedia, of all places, urban science is an interdisciplinary field that studies diverse urban issues and problems. Urban science uses a computational understanding of city systems to evaluate how they work and how they grow and change. Um, if we're not happy with uh, the authority of Wikipedia, uh, we could go to MIT um, and uh, the DUSP. A one definition which includes or which talks about it's not a definition maybe but it's about integrating data analysis visualization sensors and artificial intelligence into a planning design and policy making context etc and this 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 angle i think of 
data analysis, visualization sensors, artificial intelligence helps to capture, I think, what um, what people are more likely to start meaning these days when they, they talk about urban science, not just any science in an urban area, but this 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 kind of agenda. But of course, this this is open to uh, discussion. I also had a look at another part of the the, the MIT uh, firmament and uh, um, came across this this. Uh, rather large um, uh, collection of hashtags of topics, which includes things like art, uh, real estate, ethics, um, COVID-19, and quite a lot of, of, of um, topics that are associated with city science. Um, and I, I abstracted a few that I think sound as if they are more like the kind of uh, um, urban science or city science when we talk of it in a narrower way. Um, so although obviously we could include everything in the city, including art in, 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 in urban science, if we like, um, but these kinds of things such as robotics, um, uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things and so on, are maybe more like what we're thinking of uh, when, we, we, when we think of urban science and, and city science. Um, so when I was thinking this through, I thought, well, actually, it could be quite interesting to think, is urban science actually any different from any other kind of science so and one answer could be no if we mean urban science in the, the broader sense as I just suggested so for example you could say well the study of botany or arboriculture um etc uh it is is an is an like a normal science that just happens to be applied to street trees in an urban context so um similarly the geotechnical properties of soils that happen to be applied to a a construction site that happens to be in the urban area. Um, so these could be seen as seamless with science in the way that, um, let's say, social science sometimes isn't. So what I'm suggesting is that um, one could one could argue that so-called urban science is just another branch of science or the application of science to the urban domain. And, but it's not a kind of a sort of special kind of science in the way that, let's say, sometimes people claim that say, so social science is, is, is special and different from other kinds of science. But maybe that's another argument for another day. But to answer the question, we could also answer the question, is urban science different from other kinds of science? We could say, well, maybe if we mean, if we're talking about a different way of going about understanding cities, and then that led me to think, well, maybe the question is really, is urban science different from other kinds of urban knowledge so is is and it also depends whether we put the quote marks around the word urban science or around urban science and quote marks and i think the term computational hints at this um but i i think it's not just about computation per se um i think it's more a way of thinking uh relating to things like abstraction and, and models and so on i mean one might say you know you know, Euler didn't need a computer to, to model uh, Königsberg's urban topology as a graph. So, um, you know, it's not it's not techno technology far less 20th or 21st century, well, 21st century technology, that computation that makes urban science what it is, although it may be called the, the growth and flowering and blooming of urban science as a topic is surely associated with the rise of computational techniques. Um, so also, I think it's not just abstraction, um, it's also the way we sense and perceive the city. So sensors that um, perhaps are remote that, that, uh, that we use to sense the city rather than like the, the traditional sort of ambulant field researcher or the sort of urban flaneur who walks around experiencing the city and, and writes it all down and turns it into a book. Um, so we use non-human devi devices to sense the city. I, I think that's part of it. Also, things like you know people tapping in, in or out of public transport using a, some kind of a smart card. Things like Twitter data, um, where there are individual human inputs. Obviously, um, well, not always, I guess, with all the bots that are out there. But often it's a human input. But it's the collective picture that builds up that becomes the thing that the, the object of study which could be things that are not perceivable to the, the human on the street, as it were. Um, 
And yet we have to remember, of course, it's usually the human on the street that we're actually designing for. So um, in, the, in my brief review uh, in preparing for this lecture, I, I, I picked out four things. I guess there could easily be more um, and they could be discussed that seem to be characteristics of, of, of urban science. So one is the aforementioned computation, um, which is clearly we think of as being technological. But there are also things like big data, I'd say, where it's about the understanding of cities through, let's say, statistical regularities rather than sort of individual um, ground truth. Um, and this could be a more sort of epistemological um, uh, slant, which isn't necessarily technological per se. Also, the, the non-human sensing of the city beyond human capability or human reach, which could be somehow connected to the experiential or, dare I say, phenomenological. Uh, and then there's abstractions and models you know, that we're used to dealing with things like networks and flows, um, which could be seen as, to some extent, as treating the human realm as if physics, uh, meaning, you know, we think tend to think of um, traffic flowing, um, but in a sense, that's uh, an analogy with perhaps um, you know, water in a pipeline. But what the what animates the water in the pipeline is different from, you know, the human agents that are driving cars or walking around the city and so on. Um, and also, I would say, treating the city as a, as a kind of found object, uh, as, as I would put it, rather than as a designed object. I think sometimes urban science um, sort of looks at the city almost as if uh, a sort of alien observer looking down and trying to figure out, you know, like a slime, like, like, a, like one might study a slime mold um, um, or, or, or a termite mound. Um, so we'll come we'll come back to this, I guess. So uh, what what does urban science have to say about urban design? So I think uh, well I think we can assume that urban design theory and practice can and should be fruitfully supported by findings from any science, including urban science. Um, uh, whether in terms of you know how to understand how cities work prior to design, what to what to design or build. Um, and uh, also how how to design. So whether meaning uh, whether meaning any kind of science or a particular kind of computational understanding and method. Um, however, this is all very well and good, but is there more to it than this? More than simply you know the idea that more and better science is good. So for a more specific answer, I think I'm going to suggest we look through the lens of uh, pseudoscience uh, and. Yeah, so, so the next parts are, are already written up in the paper, so I might go a little bit faster at this point just to make sure we have enough time for discussion. So science, as we know, is not static or monolithic. It's not so much a body of knowledge as a system of establishing a body of knowledge, and it's dynamic. It invites challenge and correction. So what about pseudoscience? So pseudoscience can be laid against individuals, particular theories, and also a field as a whole, and it's the latter that I'm most interested in. So in the paper, I discuss um, various symptoms of pseudoscience that you can see there that it may have, they may have lots of information, apparent explanatory power and an incessant stream of confirmations. But where theories are fabricated only in order to accommodate known facts, um, the community of practitioners makes little attempt to develop new theory. There's no concern for attempts to evaluate the theory in relation to others and is selective in considering confirmations and disconfirmations. Um, so, uh, you know, so people like uh, who've studied this, like uh, Bunge, suggests that pseudosciences are stagnant uh, pools on the side of the swift current of uh, scientific research. And a theory should be de denounced if it fails to evolve into a fully fledged component of science at the end of, say, half a century. And this happened to coincide with when I was when I was writing this paper. It's It was about 50 years. And I thought, well, let's see about urban design. So in, in, for the purpose of the paper, I revisited four kind of classic uh, urban design uh, theory texts, the image of the city, townscape, a city is not a tree, and the death and life of great American cities. They were all 50 plus years old. Um, they are considered classics, uh, and they, are, they could be called integrated theories in which each links a theory of how the world is, or how the world works, uh, to how to do urban design. So. Um, 
so, for example, in terms of Lynch's uh, five elements, um, uh, he put forward various ideas for this. But aside from whatever Lynch was saying, um, the, the subsequent scholarship uh, who uh, reporting on and understanding uh, and reporting on, on Lynch tended to lack exploring any uh, alternatives or testing the link to design. Um, There's gen generally uncritical affirmation as if already factually established, generally not reflecting existence of subsequent uh, testing. So, um, yeah, and, you know, people keep citing Lynch 61 rather than later work in the domain. Um, similarly, Jane Jacobs had a great big hypothesis right in, in, in the middle of death and life of great American city. There was limited testing of this at the time of writing. Um, the refutations of the central thesis were almost entirely unknown. Most coverage was um, favorable and generally uncritical. Um, subsequently, there have been several uh, testing, including one by our, our host, Andres. Um, but also there was a lot of a, a kind of vociferous de defense of Jane Jacobs as well, not admitting that this testing hadn't been done, but just saying, well, she was right. Um, so the paper found that uh, 50 years on, it, it was difficult to say whether the core hypothesis of these classics were actually true. And what's more, the idea that urban design doesn't even seem interested in its scientific validation. So is urban design a pseudoscience and does it matter? Well, I, I came to the conclusion it is to at least some extent in not bothering to test and verify hypotheses, nor generate alternative hypotheses. Um, and also the way that the discipline as a whole treats individual theories and uncritically incorporates them into the fabric of its own knowledge base. And does it matter? Well, on the one hand, maybe not. Uh, maybe practitioners have a healthy scepticism to how far to trust um, urban design theory. On the other hand, how much stronger would urban design be if we had a more scientifically robust footing, perhaps in the way that medicine or, or engineering do. They're firmly based on science, even though they could be seen as arts or practicing rather than science per se. And then we get people, uh, I had this quote, quotations from Jeffrey West, who thought that a lot of urban theory was based on old methods of social science and unconstrained speculations, um, and wanted to begin again with a blank page to study cities as if they'd never been studied before. Um, and in the paper, I said, well, you know, this kind of claim if successfully prosecuted, would put conventional urban design theorists out of business. So um, we now come back to the question of urban science. So in the paper, obviously, I was looking at urban design uh, and, uh, and pseudoscience. So in this case, um, I'm interested in uh, to what extent we might apply the the lens of pseudoscience to so-called urban science. So, um, so I want to explore the, the possibility that some kinds of urban science could be pseudoscientific by appearing to be more scientific than it really is. Uh, the scientific method and ethic may be impeccable, but results or the claims about the results may not be necessarily um, as robust or authoritative compared with less scientific treatments. And I I just thought, thought uh, just to be a little bit provocative, because I know we're, we're meant to be discussing this um, uh, more generally, I thought I, I kind of came up with seven deadly sins, if you like. Um, so, uh, and as with the earlier questioning of urban design in the paper, the implied criticism isn't directed at any particular individual um, or body of work, but could be directed at any of us who practice urban analysis. So those are the uh, seven deadly sins. Uh, they're not, they don't quite follow the, 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 the biblical ones, um, although I did think of trying to fit in physics envy, but um, I decided that wasn't maybe such a deadly sin after all. So the first one is sloth, which I would say is the tendency to overlook existing urban scholarship or ignore it or just report the findings superficially, you know, papers that, that just launch into their own work, but briefly say, oh, Oh, see reference one, two, three, four, et cetera, but without showing, having learned anything from them or engaging with them in any way. The second one is ignorance, ignorance about what is actually on the ground or no attempt to actually understand the places on the ground, which is partly a lack of ground truth and partly uh, perhaps a limited framing of the question. 
the third one uh, uh, is a kind of self-delusion of oversimplification, the danger of using simplistic representations of the urban, um, perhaps based on easy data, which relates back to sloth, I suppose, um, but without acknowledging those as simplifications. And I, I don't really have time to go into this, this elaboration. I thought I'd elaboration one of the points. But, you know, the idea that we think of a street system often as a network, but, you know, is it really a network? I mean, what is a network? It's a simplification. Is it a true abstraction or is it a useful one? Um, for example, here we have an urban node or an intersection, a cul-de-sac and a boundary. And each of those is quite a different kind of thing, but each is typically modeled as a vertex in a graph. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, are you analyzing a city or are you analyzing a set of edges and vertices? Anyway, to, to, to be continued. Um, the next one is greed, I suppose, could be trying to grab and analyze too much at once. Um, uh, more and more than can be properly interpreted. Um, the next one is spurious precision or calculation to umpteen decimal places or degrees of statistical significance maybe, but based on data points that were maybe originally mapped arbitrarily or manually by someone with a, a pen and paper, um, uh, and but then you report, one could report on it, as, you know, to seven decimal places or something as if, as if this is some uh, um, uh, accurate reality. And then we've got self-delusion too, um, uh, which one might call pseudo-significance or the generation of apparently significant factors, which we could call pseudo-significant factors or psi factors, which purport to show something significant in the data, but which may have little urban uh, relevance. Um, and then uh, the final one is pride. Let's say the the overclaiming on the significance of results without sufficient acknowledgement of the limitations or sufficient reference to existing urban knowledge. And by the way, I didn't mention it earlier, but some of these faults or or sins, as it were, could be could be said of any analyst or or any uh, in yellow. The text in yellow. Uh, it could be any analyst or any academic or any scientist. So it's not, I'm not pointing the finger at urban, urban scientists in particular. And of course, any of us could find ourselves doing any of these things. Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, so urban pseudoscience question mark. Of course, these are criticisms not of urban science per se, but perhaps badly done uh, urban science. So just as when people might criticize modernism as if it's one thing or new urbanism, it's usually badly executed modernism or, or new urbanism that is at fault. Um, so I'd say what we really need is urban science done well, and ideally I'd say integrated with or synergistic with more traditional uh, urban knowledge. So I think I'm within the last five minutes uh, and uh, so an appropriate time to turn to the conclusions. So the question was, what does urban science have to say about urban design? So from my uh, quick review of the topic here um, in half an hour, I'd say, so I think urban science, like any science, can help to underpin urban design knowledge and theory. Uh, and three examples off the top of my head were use of sensing and big data could get more diverse and objective data in the city rather than the traditional ambulant academic or flaneur subjective impression of the city. Also, I'd say simulation and visualization of proposed futures, um, especially user generated um, futures, uh, could be in a way understandable and shareable by the diversity of lay, lay people. So that could break down barriers between the traditional planner in their office and the people on the street. Uh, and also new perspectives and breakthroughs in understanding uh, such as concepts of emergence, or there could be unseen patterns uh, that we don't, we don't, uh, we didn't see them before until we, you know, crunch the numbers, as it were. So that's all positive. So, like any science well done, urban science can strengthen our understanding of the urban. However, uh, just a reminder to beware the danger of pseudoscience in the sense of something appearing to be scientific but not necessarily. Beware the pitfalls of the seven deadly sins, uh, so called, and especially. I would say abstractions that fail to take account of the the human in in urban settings, and also perhaps the you know the idea of design as an explanation for 
the way urbanism is. So the idea that city is a designed object and there are human reasons for why things way they, they are the way they are. There may also be geometric or statistical reasons, but we, we shouldn't neglect the, the human. So I would say, you know, to, to almost more or less conclude, I mean, more, tradi more traditional sites may be able to provide some answers sometimes, even if cruder, uh, that are closer to the kind of knowledge urban designers need. So this is talking about the kind of science to support urban design rather than simply the urban science to know everything there is to know about a city. I'd say especially the larger context beyond the abstraction that is often used in computation um, or things like the human agency of design. However, I mean, I'm kind of contrasting traditional methods, knowledge with urban science, but I'd say it's not either or. And I think to conclude, I think we should use a combination and, and get the synergies out of both kinds of methods and insights. And I think that's, and that's got to be the future, I think. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm ready to stop sharing and uh, take uh, questions and be part of the discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing now. So thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, these stimulating thoughts. And I think it ties very well into um, the entire series of the fall uh, semester. Uh, just to start us off, and I, I do invite uh, everybody in the room to uh, place your questions, comments in the chat, and we'll start moderating these in a minute. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll get us started with a couple of quick um, questions. Um, when I when I read your um, article um, that, that um, you also discussed today, um, and, and I think about the field of um, urban design research, or uh, one might say urban science uh, that deals with the physical um, reality or the physical uh, built environment, then I, I see um, no doubt that there are uh, pretty uh, convincing bits and pieces of science going on uh, where you know this may be in the area of uh, mobility studies or transportation research or even um, housing uh, or um, urban ecology and landscape systems, et cetera, and, and people using scientifically uh, defendable yeah. methods that um, yeah. will stand yeah. the ground if any scientist would read them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. However, I see a much greater challenge with, with the availability of theories that would hold um, the bits and pieces of science together. And you've tried to pick the four um, classic um, pieces by Lynch Jacobs and others. Uh, in this, but but I, I'm left kind of um, with the impression that urban design theory is the harder part, not the sort of actual methodological process of doing uh, urban science, and that the urban design theory ends up being about like a bunch of different rocks and boulders that stand apart but don't necessarily make a pyramid that sticks together. Um, and I, I I wonder what your thoughts are on uh, you know this conundrum of we can critique the process of how somebody does research on urban design, um, but um, the bigger yeah. challenge yeah. to me does appear to be the, the capability of actually holding it all together in what we could call theory. Yeah, yes, I, I, absolutely right. That That's absolutely right. I mean, in the paper, I think I say, and um, I once had a slide on it, but I took it out. But, um, you know, it's not that there aren't individual parts of individual scientific research that's absolutely fine. There's no problem with that. Um, uh, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the paper was focusing especially on what I called integrated theories, at least kind of grand, well, not necessarily grand theories, but theories that try to link up a, an understanding of how the world works to how we should then design cities. So um, if you remember the little diagram I showed with pillars holding up the urban design theory, so those individual pillars are probably scientifically fine, scientifically uh, robust and, and so on. But the, I think the, pro the problem becomes when you one tries to create a theory, well, a theory of urban design or a theory of everything that, that, that brings everything together, um, because I think the problem is that and urban design theorists, let's say, and that could include any of us here, perhaps, um, um, put those scientific bits and pieces together in a way that is not necessarily scientific. Mm. It's the, the uncritical assimilation 
of otherwise scientific knowledge. And that's which goes into what I hinted was could be a black box, if you see what I mean, that is the is the problem that makes it pseudoscientific or is in danger of being pseudoscientific because it appears to be based on scientific theory. But the yeah. way the theories are put together in an urban grand urban design theory aren't um, necessarily so. And as I mentioned to you earlier, it's not that these theories themselves are problematic. The paper wasn't having an opinion whether those particular theories were 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 good or or not. The the, the problem is the way that that the I think the, the 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 urban design theory as a discipline, if you like, um, is uncritical. And the other thing is is that um, so it's about holding together exactly as you said. But also, um, I think the the problem is we don't we don't tend to throw things away. I mean, the thing about science science is right. You know, you you you've got one theory right, and then someone comes up with another theory and knocks the old one out of the way. You know, we we get rid of stuff. I mean, now say talking as a you know from a sci scientist, discard theories that are pro shown to be not correct or not useful. But I think we. In our urban design, we we tend to have all these parallel theories, you know, um, you, you know whether it's Lynch or Alexander or I think I think I remember I remember, you know, talking to the the late Bill Hillier about something and I asked him something about, you know, Kevin Lynch or, or Chris Alexander and and of course he he answered in a way that he saw the world working, which would be slightly different from, from the way that they saw the and like and all these theorists think of the world in a different way. And they, their theories aren't necessarily compatible, and which makes you wonder: well, maybe they can't all be right. But does urban design, as a as a discipline, ever disprove them and say, well, this one's right, so we better get rid of that one, or they, they or do they just kind of linger around? Mm -hmm. And that's I, I didn't quite say it. It was on one of the slides, but you know, mm -hmm. so urban practitioners maybe come along, that is actual urban designers, and they'll sort of pick from oh, I like. I like, you know, I like that bit of theory there, or I'm working in this kind of site, and I think Alexander works for me there. You know, even if the the complete Alexandrian theory, which ultimately is a, a theory of the cosmos, you know, um, isn't compatible necessarily with, you know, with 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 um, you know, the next person's theory. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think this also interestingly gets to the heart of some of the challenges why theory making is is so challenging and so difficult as i think you're also hinting at the fact that uh in when it comes to urban design then it's hard to separate um uh subjective values from from facts that uh one could sort of uh you know describe processes and verify and, and test hypotheses um i think um uh Lynch actually himself at some point referred to, and talking about the imageability of cities, referred to the kind of fact that the image is con constituted by structure, identity, and meaning. And identity and meaning always creep into the picture. And those are topics and issues that really are hard to kind of put on a scientific table to, to um, uh, yeah. For somebody to kind of repeat and, and do experiments around and test hypotheses with. So uh, when actually um, one of our colleagues here at MIT, um, Nicholas de Moncho, once uh, I think aptly described the work of um, some of the early urban science that came out of the Santa Fe Institute of Complexity Studies. This is work by physicists and who are interested yeah. in complexity as if, you know, these are basically, they, they see the world as if there's an alien from a remote planet landing on Earth and detecting certain recognizable yeah. patterns. But when it comes to planners and urban designers, uh, oftentimes uh, that's not enough uh, to, 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 to recognize a scaling law of, of, of how, let's say, infrastructure scales with city size is, yes, uh, an interesting fact, but there's so much more to it if you actually go into a city. And then that's where I think the kind of issues of identity and meaning start coming into the picture, which makes it incredibly challenging to, to look at um, uh, or build theory with, with just sort of um, large uh, structural parameters that describe the physical reality or the model in the system of interactions, but not necessarily how we interpret it, what it means to us, what its identity is for us, and, and, and where things get normative and subjective. Um, so what, what do you think about this sort of challenge between 
the physics envy of model making where we just look at um, parameterizing the environment and the interactions of components versus in urban design, every piece of architecture, every design of a street, every public space being also written with meaning that goes well beyond uh, the, the physical characteristics of its structure. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, briefly, I mean, I think you know, science by its nature tends to progress because you know, uh, and because we, we we accumulate knowledge and good knowledge, if you like, and and get rid of uh, less uh, less reliable uh, knowledge or theories. Um, so science is always improving, and 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 you know, in the long term, it's quite likely that science will be able to do things that we can't really imagine. So I, I've got no problem with. You know, with 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 that side of things, you know, people once we get into things like neuroscience and um, you know understanding how people and uh, how how people um, you know perceive, uh, and we could be able to 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 sort of explain why people feel the way they do and things like identity. I mean, in the long term, I think uh, that those territories could be claimed by 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 our, our urban science if they're not yeah. if they're already being. Um, the point about seeing the world as an alien, yes. I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I've thought of that a, a few times. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's good because we, we're just taking ourselves outside the picture and, and seeing things from a different perspective and we can see the world in, in different ways. And, and so I, I wouldn't discourage that at all. The, I think the problem is, is when um, there might be a very obvious solution uh, that answers a question like say uh, you know one that I'm familiar with is maybe street design or road design rules and you know you get sometimes you might find people building you know building models for urban growth and just completely excluding uh, I mean urban network growth if you like but completely excluding the fact that a human engineer let's say decided you know have they have a way of working and designing stuff and that includes you know, road junctions with what a scientist would say has a different degree, you know, um, a, a different the nodal degree, you know. But but in the engineer will might have a, a you know a manual that says stop building crossroads, you know, um, like in the UK for example, in residential roads we stopped generally building roads with four way intersections. And the thing is, if you take a a, a, a large scientific view of it, you might start noting that. The, the average degree you know, reduced by 0 0.20 or something, you know, um, but but not consulting the fact that th this, there's a reason for it and it's in a design manual, but that's not part of the, the focus mm -hmm. of the study. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to hand it over to Ariana, who, who can get us into the some of the questions and comments that are coming out of the chat. Um, thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Andres. And thank you, Professor. Uh, for the wonderful presentation. So I'll get us started with a couple of questions around the cross-disciplinarity of urban science and urban studies more broadly. Yeah. Um, and so we know that urban studies have been, has been historically very cross-disciplinary. For example, in the chat, uh, Ryan Stevenson was uh, noting that urban studies sort of needs urban ecology, needs landscape ecology, as well as even cybernetics. And so a couple of us were wondering whether you think there, sh there are or should be any methodological bounds on urban science. Um, well, off the top of my head, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see why one would put bounds. Um, I mean, I think, I think we need to be able to, we need to be able to draw knowledge from wherever, wherever knowledge can be found that can help to improve our cities. Uh, and if that includes you know, e ecology or, or, or cybernetics, then, then fine. I mean, they, 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 you know, knowledge, knowledge is a continuum, if you like, and and we break it down into discrete, uh, you know, departments and, <laughs> to, you know, in institutions and journals. Um, but I don't think I, 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 I mean, I don't think, um, yeah, I, I, it's hard. It's hard off the top of my head to think why one would put uh, bounds on what what knowledge we we seek, what what knowledge we seek for, or from where it comes. That makes sense. So you do see value, let's say, like in having an urban science embedded within an urban studies department when you use sort of computational tools or abstraction or models to study urban environments. 
uh, right? Like the example that you were mentioning about botany or like the analysis of trees and how they help yeah. air pollution, that, be, yeah. that becomes or makes a topic urban, but we could study that either in the ecology department or in urban studies, right? And so relatedly, how do you think that would be, do you think that study of that process of trees affecting air pollution would be different if it were done in an urban studies department versus oh, I see. being yeah. done in an ecolo ecology department? Well, do you see any value? Oh, I, I, I see what you mean. Well, I think, I mean, an urban studies department can't do everything. In, okay. If that if that's the, the point of the question, then, you know, we, you know, there, there has to be a, probably a critical mass of knowledge within a, a particular department, if that's the nature of the question. So the question becomes one of dissemination and how we keep track of the findings that come from, say, an ecological department and how to get that information from the ecological uh, department, or it could be cognition, cognitive science, or whatever it is, and how to get that into the into the urban uh, realm. I mean, the other the other thing I would add in, which I I, I touched on very very briefly, but you know, so you know, social sciences all, also may need to be in there somewhere too, to to to, uh, which may be a bit of an understatement. But some would argue that you know we need to study human society if we're going to design for human society, and we need to understand politics and like you know how things get built and who's building them and who are they for as well um so i guess each department will in any university will have its own reasons for you know how it came to be and the focus it, it would tend to have um i mean i don't think there's a single template for what the ideal coverage would be i mean it's just you know in some ways Universities are a bit anarchic and <laughs> based on, you know, path dependent, you know, de decisions that led one department to be called urban studies and planning and another one to be called, you know, something else, you know, city planning or um, city development or and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving forward, we had a couple of questions about how to how to incorporate urban science in practice. And so here I would like to call Bruce to unmute yourself and maybe ask your question. Thank you, Ariana, and thank you, uh, Professor Marshall. It's very exciting and interesting talk. I was curious to know, um, you know, not only the experts and the planners, you know, or other uh, practitioners, but the public or civic engagement? And do you have thoughts as to how these uh, questions of urban design and urban science that you've been describing might be important uh, when involving others in the conversation? Well, I, yes, I mean, I, I, I think um, if, if to the extent that urban science would include things like simulation, visualization and um, um, I, I know there were some other keywords there, maybe augmented reality and stuff like that. I think they 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 should, in theory, ha have ability, for example, to engage with 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 end users if they're like proposals. So I, I think I touched on it very briefly. So some people, for example, are not used to reading a plan. Like as professionals, we or people who study geography, we you know we we or architecture, we we know what a plan is, we know how to read a cross section and so on, but members of the public don't necessarily and if urban science can help to visualize the impact of proposals or 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 the actual physical form of proposals that you can fly around and fly around and through a design for example um then i think that could help break down barriers between the professionals and the and the members of the public um and also uh also even if if users are are able to uh go onto a platform uh that is civic design related and and be able to manipulate things themselves by uh you know um, be able to create their own designs and share those online that um that can reach other users and it, it could could facilitate participation so so yes in that in that sense and and i think that's probably an important point to get across that um you know urban science doesn't need to be seen as a purely kind of technocratic exercise um uh, but it could assist with well as you as you as you're alluding to bre breaking down barriers between you know the professionals uh, and and end users or the, the public yeah 
Thank you, Bruce. Um, so maybe in the couple of minutes that we have left, I'll ask you a final question, um, which is related to sort of the scientific method and urban design. Um, so arguably, urban science allows us to answer new questions or revisit old questions of urban design, maybe uh, through computation or new data sources. Um, and someone in the chat were wondering from a practical perspective, if you could reflect maybe on the types of questions that you think would benefit the most from this computational perspective. Maybe some mentioned that say the evolution of cities and maybe tracking how they change over time related to other complex systems, but maybe you could also touch a little bit more on your work on morphology and how you see uh, sort of urban science influencing that subfield specifically. Okay, um, that's uh, that's probably quite a challenging uh, question <laughs> um, for, um, for, uh, for me at uh, 6.30 in the evening. Let me think. Um, um, well, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I think in general, the advances that we see in urban science are very, um, are, are very, uh, diverse, uh, and very, um, uh, very, um, what's the word? Um, they, they can be proceeding at quite, uh, quite, uh, um, impressive rate. So, like I mentioned very briefly, the idea that some some uh, disciplines are very stagnant in in you know their methods and they're, they're, they're doing the same old thing and they're not necessarily learning much more new. But the, the the rapid advances, I think, in different kinds of whether we call it urban science or sciences that contribute to the urban, so which we, we might include things like neuroscience and cognitive science and so on. You know, great. You know, I think advances can can be as quick as in you know, full-blown science, if you like. And so I think there are lots of, um, you know, opportunities there um, that, and they, they could end up coming in unexpected places. I mean, just to use a very brief example, you know, when when Twitter was invented, right, um, you know, did, did the founders imagine that one day, you know, people would be analyzing hashtags you know, um, one one of our our our, our doctoral students, um, like they were an, analyzing hashtags for um, people visiting a stadium in London, and you know the, the, the amount of things you can. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was now. There was some there was something to do with guns and roses, and and they they had you know they, 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 the term guns and roses was 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 because they were they were doing a concert at the stadium, right? And you know it just like you can't necessarily predict how. And they were they were they were kind of analyzing maybe the sentiments uh, that were relating to the people traveling to the stadium on the day of the event, um, and yeah, I mean, it just it's it's hard to imagine that the the uses to which that kind of in, uh, information could be could be put. You know, people are actually analyzing words, so it becomes things through linguistics. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that could be a good question for the future. Um, I maybe can't can't right now generate a whole list of 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 things, but I think I think we we have to we have to at least allow for um, the the possibility of quite new things uh, emerging that that we could apply uh, to the to to the urban. Um, if if I use a I, I mean I could use another example perhaps um, which is not new but um, like if you think of things like when going back to street networks, you know, people analyzing things like the lengths of roads, so like, or the lengths of road sections and so on. So that kind of thing is not something that really, let's say designers or engineers necessarily think about, you know, you lay out a street and you join up this street to that one. And in a sense, the distribution of street length isn't something that necessarily really matters. So it was not maybe something that people bothered to investigate, but when it becomes possible to just click a button and create a chart that shows it, then new things that it can can emerge. Um, so uh, and that those might tell us about um, you know how hierarchical structures develop and emerge. And so anything to do with emergence, I'll add that in. Um, and so so for things, and it relates back to the thing about design because. Some things have a very simple human explanation for why things are designed the way they are. And it's good that urban scientists don't forget to maybe ask designers what was going on. 
Um, but on the other hand, um, the study, obviously the study of aggregate, aggregate amounts of data and big data and so on might detect patterns that, you know, that weren't, that weren't, uh, that weren't seen before. And it can tell us um, new things about, you know, how, how we understand um, urban areas. So, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Great. Uh, we are out of time, so this is perfect. Um, thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, hear your thoughts on this. Uh, if you're around, uh, maybe we can stick online and I'll create a room for another couple of minutes to, to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everybody, sure. for, for participating. Um, and just as a reminder, we're back to the regular Monday schedule starting next week with a presentation by Sean Rickenbacker um, from New York. So just a round of applause for Stephen. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. And and it, it's a very interesting question that you set up. So, and I think the discussion, it would be nice to think the discussion can continue and, you know, it's a topic that can be revisited time and again, I think. So thanks yeah. for the good question. Hey, we will certainly share the chat window with you as well. So you'll see some more questions that we didn't quite get to. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. So, thank you. So